Well, all right, let's uh, open our Bibles to the uh, book of Philippians, and we now are in the closing verses of uh, chapter 4 as we started uh, our study in Philippians several months ago as we make our way verse by verse through the New Testament here in our weekend services. I think that it's important that I remind you what it is that I do here. I I am a simple-minded guy, and the only thing that I know to do is just go from Genesis to Revelation verse by verse. I'm not sophisticated enough to come up with some of these tricky and catchy sermon titles and sermon series. I just, look, I got one string on this guitar, and it's just verse by verse through the Old and the, uh, the New Testament. Now, what that means is, is that the subject matter of every sermon is then determined by the subject matter of the portion of Scripture that we happen to come to next. And so the subject matter of these closing verses of chapter 4 deals with the subject of giving, all right? So the only reason why we're talking about giving today is because this is what the portion of Scripture is dealing with that we've now come to. This is not a part of my grand scheme to try and separate you from your money. It's just where we find ourselves. Now, how many of us know that the church has received a lot of criticism because of its approach to money? How many unbelievers do you know that say, look, that's all that church is interested in? That's all they are interested in is, is getting into my billfold, and I am very hard-pressed not to disagree with them. I look at some ministries, and I have to say, yes, you are right. I believe that they are in this solely for the reason of raising funds and enriching themselves. Now, when a church has a giving problem, now, we do not have a giving problem here. But when a church has a giving problem, that is not a root cause. That is a symptom of a deeper and a more serious problem. It could be that you have greedy and foolish church leaders. They are trying to enrich themselves or they are spending money foolishly. And they are taking the church into a, a debt load that the church has no business handling. And if you, in your private finances, if you spend your money foolishly, you too can end up with money problems. And the same thing is true with the church. If they spend their money foolishly, the church can end up with money problems. Sometimes the reason why churches have to always talk about money is that it is an indication of spiritual immaturity. A spiritually mature Christian is a giving and a generous individual. Now, how do we measure maturity? We do not measure maturity by the size of cross you got around your neck or the size of Bible under your arm or on the coffee table back home. We measure maturity by how much of your heart is being possessed by the Spirit of Christ. Christ did not come to take. He came to give. Christ did not come to be served. He came to serve. And the more of his Spirit that has a hold of you, the more generous you're going to be. Now again, you are a spiritually mature congregation. You are a giving congregation. I have been here for 29 years, and never once have we had to beat anybody up over giving. Never once have you been manipulated. Never once have we turned the screws on you. Come on, church, you've got to dig down deep. And with God's grace and mercy, we'll go another 29 years without that happening. Now, here's what's going on in the church world today, here in the United States. And, and there has been a sea change take place, and most of us have been completely unaware of what is going on. You go back about 30 35 years ago, there was a significant change that started to happen in churches. Now, there was a time, if you're my age or older, you remember that there was a time in this country when there was great brand loyalty. You remember that? Where Americans were very loyal to the brands that they chose. Grandpa drove a Ford, Daddy drove a Ford, I'm going to drive a Ford. The only TV set that'll be in this house is a Magnavox, a Zenith. The only 
The only appliances we'll ever have is a Maytag and a GE. And we were very loyal to those brands. And we were also loyal to our brand of Christianity. Grandpa was a Methodist. Daddy was a Methodist. I'm going to be a Methodist. There was no such thing as church shopping. If you move from one community to another and, and, and you left a Baptist church in your former community, you didn't shop for a church. Maybe you had to decide which Baptist church I'm going to go to in the new community, but you stayed true to your brand. Now, what happened? What began to happen 30, 35 years ago was the rise of non-denominationalism. Now, we are a non-denominational church. We're a part of what has been going on in the church culture. And what the rise of non-denominationalism brought was now Americans have all kinds of choices. Do you understand that in 1990, that was not very long ago, less than 200,000 Americans described themselves as being non-denominational. By 2010, that number had grown somewhere between 12 and 13 million. There was an explosion, and there continues to be an explosion, of non-denominationalism. Look at how many denominational churches are trying to distance themselves from their denomination. How many denominational churches are you aware of? They don't even have the name of their denomination out on the sign in front of their building. You can go to a Baptist church for 10 years and not even know you're a Baptist. I mean, there is this fleeing from denominationalism. Now, what this has brought in is a very consumeristic approach to the selection of a church. The number one question that Americans ask themselves when looking for a church is, what can this church do for me? And what this has brought about is is that, look, if the church on the south side of the road is offering free yoga classes with free child care, and the church on the north side of the road is not, and I happen to be into yoga, well, then I am going to lean towards that church on the south side of the road. Now, church leaders have picked up on this, and church leaders are beginning to understand that if they want their church to grow, they have to make people comfortable. They have to cater to that consumerism that is in the mind. And I think that it's very easy to document that what has been going on in the last 30 years 35 years is a dumbing down of the Bible, a dumbing down of discipleship. Don't make anybody uncomfortable. Don't challenge anybody. Now, we have got families in this church, and this is their story. The churches that they came from, they loved. The churches that they used to be a part of, they gave their blood, their sweat, and their tears to. They donated thousands and thousands of dollars to those churches over the years. But something began to happen. They began to notice that there was a change. They began to notice that there was a dumbing down. And eventually they showed up at church one day and the pastor is up there on the stage and he isn't even reading the Bible. He's reading some guy's book. And he's got his motorcycle up there and he's got all of his, you know, various props up there. And they looked around and they said, I cannot grow in this environment. I am not being challenged. I am not being encouraged encouraged to go deeper in, in my discipleship. And so they meet with the pastor. And this is where it gets very interesting. And so many of the families in this church, they've got the same story where they have gone to the pastor and they've said, look, can you just teach the Bible? Can you just, look, I love my church. I don't want to go anywhere else. Can you just teach me the Bible? And sort of in a Christian way, they were told, don't let the door hit you in the rear end on the way out. And now you've got to navigate those waters. You've got to navigate that bitterness and that anger. And, uh, you know, I hear, hear I've given my blood, my sweat, my tears to this church, and I don't even get so much as a thank you, and they don't even care now that I'm leaving. Now, this is the dirty little secret. As you're leaving the church and you're taking your family with you, there are four new families coming in. 
And from that leadership's perspective, we are up four to one. What's to be upset about? Who would not take those odds? But here is what happens. You see, you end up here, and we are blessed that you're here because what's going to happen over the course of your lifetime, you're, you, the one who takes discipleship seriously, you give and you give generously, and you will give far more than those who do not take their faith quite as seriously as you take yours. So understand that in North America, the average church that has 10 to 15,000 members is currently carrying an average debt of $15 million. Lots of people, lots of people, but lots of debt. So what I am about to say I am not directing at it, it, it at you at all. You are a mature congregation, and no matter what need is ever brought before you, you give marvelously, and I pray that God richly blesses you. We, we had Mike here last week from Nepal. Whatever money goes into the offering box and the missions, we'll be sure to give it to him this week and last week. And I know... I know that when the dust settles, you will have given thousands and thousands of dollars to the brother without any arm twisting at all. It's based upon what conviction God has placed upon your heart in the privacy of your own heart. But let's look now, as Paul closes this out, let's look at what he says about charitable contributions. He says in verse 10, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am, even the state of Indiana, to be content. Now, he is in prison. You remember he's in prison in Rome. The church in Philippi has heard, hey, the guy that started our church is in prison in Rome. They took up a collection. They gave it to this man by the name of Epaphroditus. He hikes on down to Rome, looks up the apostle Paul. Now again, in the first century, you end up in prison. They're not gonna feed you. They're not gonna clothe you. They're not gonna give you any kind of medical attention. If you survive your imprisonment, you survive because of the goodness and the kindness of friends and family outside the prison. Epaphroditus has been sent there buying him notebook paper, I guess, and buying him clothes and buying him food or whatever it is that he needs. Now, he says, you have once again given to me. Now, notice that he says here, I am not saying thank you because I am looking for another opportunity for you to give. I'm not bringing it up because I want you to give again. I'm just sincerely thanking you. Now, notice that he says an interesting thing there. Notice that he says, you wanted to give, but you lacked opportunity. They lacked opportunity, why? Well, they didn't have an address. I mean, you talk about where in the world is Waldo? Well, where in the world is the Apostle Paul? I mean, imagine you're in first century Philippi, you'd like to give money to the missionary Paul. Where are you gonna send it? Where, where's he at? I mean, is he in Jerusalem? Is he in Turkey? Is he shipwrecked off the shore of Malta? Where in the world is the guy at? But now, now they've locked onto him. Word is re hey, he's in prison. He hadn't gone anywhere. We got a solid address. We can get money to him now. And that is exactly what they did. Now notice, he said, I have learned contentment. Contentment is something that you have to learn. Contentment is not caught, contentment is taught. And the Lord wants to teach you contentment. Now, let's notice what he says about contentment, verse 12. He says, but I know how to be abased. I know how to live on ramen noodles. And I know how to abound. I know how to live on filet mignon. And everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, sometimes you'll see an athlete put this verse in their tennis shoe or their baseball mitt or some. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can win the championship. I can be the MVP. 
In the context, the power of Christ and the strength of Christ is given to us not to win championships, but to do something far more harder, and that is to learn contentment. Here's what we do. We go after that which we think will make us happy. We've all done it, right? We have all done it. Maybe we've done it this week. We've seen something. We've locked on to it, haven't we? And we thought, if I had that, if I had that right there, I would never ask for another thing the rest of my life. If I had that house, oh, if I could just have that house, I would never ask God for anything else. As Americans, we are a very unsettled bunch. We're changing jobs about every 4.6 years. We change careers over the course of our lifetime, somewhere between five and seven times. We, as a culture, we are on the move. We like to move. We're moving about every eight and a half years. Now, what is interesting about this to me is that coming out of World War II, we began to prosper. We're moving on up, aren't we? We're getting bigger homes. And during the 50s and 60s, we were actually moving about every five years. Now, the condition, it, you see, it is not natural for us. It's not natural for us to be content. It's natural for us to constantly hunger. And we'll lock on to say, oh, if I could just get that house, if I could get that, if the, if the appraisal will come in right and my credit score is high enough, oh, if I could just get that, how happy of a camper I would be. Well, go ahead and get the house. Get the house. You know what's going to happen? Six months from now, you're going to want to change the floor covering. You're going to want to change the curtains. You're going to want to change the color. You know how we are. You remember that Jesus said to the woman at the well, here's a woman very discontent. I mean, she's going through husbands like we go through socks, right? She is very discontent. And you remember that Jesus said to her, now you drink this water. You drink this. You drink from this physical well. You are going to thirst again. You can write that verse over every material pursuit that you have in your mind right now. Everything that you want, go ahead, go ahead, buy it, drink it, enjoy it, but you will thirst again. And what the Lord wants each of us to learn is contentment. Now, what is contentment? Contentment is a peace that comes from being in a right relationship with God, knowing that he is in control of everything that happens, and our focus is on him and not on the love of money and things. And so here is a cat that is saying to us, look, man, I have gone through seasons where I didn't know where my next meal was coming from. I I have gone through seasons where the table has been loaded with great food, but it doesn't matter what comes across my path. God is in control. God is at work. And when he is done with me, I am going to resemble the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, notice in verse 14, he says now, nevertheless, you have done well in that you have shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Isn't it interesting? Here's a guy. He started all of these churches. There's only one, only one church that thought about him. There was only one church that was ministering to him uh, in his missionary endeavors. Now, the problem that we have is that we're conflicted. We're conflicted. There are two forces that are at work over us. One is we understand we are responsible before God to be faithful with what God has given to us. Where much is given, much is required. We understand that the word of God talks a lot about money. 16 of the 38 parables of Jesus dealt with money and position, uh, possessions. One out of every 10 verses in the gospel uh, dealt with money. The Bible gives us 500 verses that deal with prayer, 500 verses that deal with faith, over 2,000 verses uh, that deal with money and, and possession. The Bible talks a lot about us being faithful with what God has given us. So we've got that. We've got pressure coming at us from that side. But there are thieves there are charlatans, there are sharks in the church. Not everybody that's got a Bible, not everybody that carries a cross around their neck is of God. What did he just tell us one chapter before this in chapter three? For many, 
not a few, not a handful, many of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. There are those in the church that want to separate you from your money and they want to enrich themselves. And so look, we've got these two pressures on us. We've got the pressure of the knowledge that there are con artists. We've got the pressure of knowing that, yeah, I'm responsible before God to be a charitable person. When I was 17 years old, I came to the saving knowledge of Christ. I didn't know anything. I, did, I, I had no church background at all. And I got, very quickly, I got involved in a church where the pastor was accustomed to saying at the end of a service or before an offering, all right, let's, let's bow our heads, let's close our eyes. God has told me that there are 10 people here that is supposed to give $500. Now look, I didn't know anything. And I was so naive. It had never crossed my mind that anybody would lie to me at church. It had never crossed my mind. I thought if you are on the stage and you're teaching the Bible, everything that you are telling me is truthful. And when that guy was saying, God has told me there are 10 people that are supposed to give 500 bucks, I honestly believe that God was up there whispering in his ears and I just wasn't spiritual enough to, to see it. I'm telling you, I was a prime candidate to become a cult member and it is only by God's grace that I did not become one. And in one of these occasions, I remember, I, and now what do I know, all right? What do I know? Maybe, maybe it was God, maybe it wasn't, but I'm sitting there in this service and I swear to you, I, I mean, I believe that God wanted me to be one of these 10. Here I am, 17 years old. I don't even have a checking account. And so I, I raised my hand. Yes, I'm one of the 10. I'm going to do it, by golly. And, and it wasn't some weird pride thing. I mean, I was as sincere as I could be. And I went home, and I got that money together, took me a few weeks to do, and I was so excited. And I wasn't excited because I thought I was something. I was excited because I believed that I was doing the will of God. And I wasn't going to wait till the weekend. I was going to go to that church in the middle of the week. And I went down there in the middle of the day, and I had that $500 cash. And I went into that church office, and I said, I'd like to talk to the pastor. And she said, well, what do you want to talk to him about? I said, I made a commitment to that man, and I am here to fulfill that commitment. I was serious. And so she led me down the hallway, the guy's office, and he opened the door. And what can I do for a young man? I said, you know, a couple weeks ago, when you said God told you that there were these people that give $500, well, I'm one. And I'm here, and I took those five Benjamins, and I stuck those out there. And I will never forget this as long as I live. There was the weirdest the most bizarre expression that came on his face. And he very, very reluctantly reached out and took that money because I like to believe that it was the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And he realized that he had manipulated a babe in Christ, very naive babe in Christ, but he had manipulated me. And, and of course, it didn't change anything. He continued to, to, to behave that way. But it taught me a lesson. And God used that, that we are not to manipulate people to give. Now, why? Notice what he says in verse 16. He says, for even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once, and again, notice twice. You sent offerings twice for my necessities, not that I seek the gift. I wasn't asking, but I seek fruit that it abounds to your account. Now, you've got to appreciate what he has just told us. You've got to understand the background of this church. We covered it in our introduction. We covered it when we were going through the book of Acts. You remember now, we are in the first century Macedonia. Today, it's northern Greece. Paul is in the town of Philippi. He goes down by the riverside, starts this church from a little prayer meeting with a handful of women. You remember the prison guard, the guy that's over the prison. He comes to saving knowledge of Christ, and a church is birthed in Philippi. How long was he there? 
He wasn't there very long at all, was he? And then what did he do? He then traveled 100 miles to the west, the southwest, to the town of Thessalonica. How long did it take him to walk 100 miles? A few days, maybe a week, we don't know. Not very long. He is in Thessalonica for how long? Luke tells us he was there for three Sabbath days. He was only in Thessalonica for three weeks. So how old is the church at Philippi? Month? Month old, maybe? Here is a month old church, and this month old church has now sent an offering to the missionaries, not once, but twice. Now, why did they send the offering? Notice, mark it carefully, for necessities. He was not raising money so he could have another villa overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. He was not looking to upgrade the nice chariot that he had. Now, look. You think about how gullible the American church has become. The early church took this very, very seriously. As we come out of the first century, there is a document that we have that is known as the Didache. The Didache, or the teaching of the 12, is a writing that gives us a summary of what the apostles taught. It, it takes the New Testament and it boils it down to about maybe... 100 verses or so. In the Didache, it's sort of a handbook for Christian living, sort of a handbook for the church. And it says, among other things, when an apostle goes forth, let him accept nothing but bread until he reaches his night's lodging. If he asks for money, he is a false prophet. Somebody comes into your church and they start begging for money. They are not of God. It also said this, whosoever shall say in the spirit, give me money, or something else, you shall not listen to him. But if he tells you to give on behalf of others in one, then let none judge him. Paul said, I was not asking for money. Now think about what we are doing in this country. You got this guy on Christian TV. He's got a private jet. He lives in multiple mansions. He lives like a king. And he has the gall to say to you and I, Give me money? Are you nuts? Are you out of your mind? Look, you sell the mansion, sell the private jet, fly coach like the rest of us, all right? And you, you, you know, uh, you, you get rid of your uh, riches and start living like the rest of us. Well, then maybe I might think about supporting you. Now, when Paul was at Thessalonica, what was he doing? He writes to the Thessalonians and he says, we were not idle when we were with you. We never accepted food from anyone without paying for it. We worked hard day and night and so we would not be a burden on you. So what happened? Paul goes down to Thessalonica to start a church. He's got needs. He's got to eat. He's got this team with him. They need to survive. And so what do they do? During the day, they got part-time jobs. And they're working here. And then at night, they're, they're trying to build this church. Somebody from Philippi comes down with an offering, gives them the offering. They're able to buy necessities. They're able to buy food and clothing. The guy goes back to Philippi and says to this month-old church, do you know what they're doing? Down, do you know what the missionaries are doing down there? They got to work, all right? They're not busy planting the church. They're not preaching the gospel during the day. They're work. We need to help those guys out. And so they raise something else. But I want you to notice over and over again, Paul is not asking. He is allowing the Holy Spirit to work in the privacy of the believer's heart. And if God puts it on your heart, give. If God doesn't put it on your heart, then don't give. Now, notice what he then says in verse 18. He says this, indeed, I have all in about, I am full. Look, I don't need any more. All right, I got enough. I'm full. This is amazing. Having received from Epaphroditus the things sent to you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God, and my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, this congregation gave of their own accord, and it was well-pleasing. If you cannot give of your own accord, then don't give. Look, Paul told the Corinthians, when you are determining what kind of contribution you are to make, that is to be made. That decision is to be made at home. You don't come to church, and then they start showing you some pictures of some starving kids, and, oh, I got to give now. They showed me those starving kids. No, no. 
you pray about it. When you're at your house and you listen and you go with what God has laid on your conscience, and if we give willingly, notice that he says it is a sweet-smelling savor on the Lord. Why? Because it is a picture of Christ being formed in you. It is the spirit of Christ at work in your heart, and God is well pleased with that. Husband and wife have an anniversary this week, and so the husband stops after work, picks his wife up something, goes home and says, Here's your dumb gift. Want you to know it costs a lot of money. The only reason why I got it, I knew you'd have an old hissy fit. You'd hit the ceiling if I didn't get you anything. I hope you're happy. Now, how happy will she be? Not happy at all. Because it does not come out of a cheerful heart. It doesn't come out of a heart of love. Our offering is to be our expression of God. And if you can't give it with a clear conscience because you want to give it, if you cannot give it, Lord, I love you. And this is just a small token of, oh, how I appreciate what you have done in my life. Then do not give. If it's not of a free will, don't give. Now, notice he says God's going to pay back. God is going to pay back. You remember when Jesus had that encounter with that rich guy? That rich guy was walking away from him. I believe the scene was, rich guy's got his back to Jesus, and Jesus is looking at him, walk down that road, and the 12 are behind him. And Jesus said, oh, how hard it is for the rich to be saved. How hard it is for the rich come salvation, because rich people are self-made people as a rule. Rich people, hard workers, they're diligent. Salvation is not self-made. Salvation is a free gift. Very difficult for the self-made man or woman to come to Christ by, by uh, grace. And, and Peter, Peter asks a question. Uh, Peter, he, all 12 wanted to ask. He's the only one dumb enough to ask it. And you remember that Peter said, well, what, what, we, we've given up everything. Uh, what, uh, what would we get? I mean, everybody wanted to know that, right? I mean, I gave up a lot to follow you. Now, what's in it for me? He's the one dumb enough to ask. And you remember, Jesus doesn't spin around and say, oh, there you go, you selfish you know, guy. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, everyone who's given up houses, brothers, sisters, father, or mother, or children, or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. Look, God is going to pay. We don't sacrifice. We invest. All right, we invest. He says in verse 20, Now to God, our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Every greet, every saint in Christ Jesus, the brethren who are with me, they greet you. Now remember, this is a church. They were struggling with unity. How do we maintain unity? How do we maintain a family feel in our church? First of all, he says, greet everybody. And it means you greet everyone individually. Every single person in our church is important. You are not more important than anybody else, but nobody else is more important than you. Isn't that interesting? You're not more important than anybody, but nobody else is more important than you. We greet everybody. And, and one historian put it this way. He says, what the first century world saw was the phenomenon of people of all walks of life loving one another, caring for one another, praying for one another, slaves and free men, rich and poor, Roman citizens and non-citizens, members of the establishment and those violently opposed to the establishment, to the utter amazement of the world outside. They were bound together in an inexplainable love and unity, Jesus said. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. You have love one for another. And so they loved one another. They greeted every single person. Every single person was important. And notice they were in Christ. Consider this. More than 40 times we have the name of Christ in this short letter. On average, about once every two or three verses. What the Apostle Paul promoted was not a thing but a person. Christ Jesus, uh, the Lord. As we continue to stay Christ-centered as a church, we will continue to remain a healthy body. As we celebrate the presence of everybody, and as we celebrate the chief presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, we remain healthy. Finally, verse 22, we close here. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household, the grace of 
of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Here is why Paul was put in prison. Why would the Lord take the greatest evangelist, the greatest church planner in all of church history and lock him up for years in prison? Why would God do that? Well, now he knows why. God loved the family of Caesar Nero. Adam Clark says this, Nero at the time was the emperor of Rome, a more worthless, cruel, and diabolical wretch, never disgraced the name or form of man. And yet in his family, there were Christians. God loved that man. God loved that man's family. How could God get the gospel to the royal family? I know, I will have the greatest evangelist be falsely accused in Jerusalem. He will become a labeled enemy of the state. Thereby, he has to be secured by the secret service. The secret service brings him to the city of Rome. The secret service places guards in his cell for six-hour shifts. Can you imagine locked in a cell with the Apostle Paul for six hours? These guys are dropping like flies. I mean, they are coming to the Lord like you can't believe. And then they leave their prison ministry and they begin to guard then the royal family. And now the royal family begins to be picked off by the grace and the mercy of God. Paul had no idea back in Jerusalem, why am I falsely accused? Why does God have me behind bars? What is God up to? Had he jumped ship, this marvelous work of God never would have happened. How often in our life do we find ourselves looking heaven? Why, God? Why have you allowed this? Why are you doing it? And we get mad and we jump ship and we never see the glorious thing that God wanted to bring about in our life. Now notice how he closes here. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. How did he close out Ephesians that we finished a while back? He said, the grace be with all of them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Before that, we had Galatians. How does Galatians end? Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Before that, we had 2 Corinthians. How does that end? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, be with you all. Amen. 1 Corinthians. How did that end? Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Before that, we had Romans. How does Romans end? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And next week, we're going to move into Colossians. How does Colossians end? Grace be with you. Amen. And then we move into Philemon. How does that end? The same way. Then we move into Timothy. How does that end? The same way. Then we move into Titus. How does that end? The same way. Then we move into Hebrews. It ends the same way. Grace, 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 grace. God has been so gracious to us. We love God because he first loved us. We give to God because he has lavished us and given to us out of the richness of his mercy. This week, let's celebrate the grace of our God. Father in heaven, we thank you for this great book of Philippians. How it is a reminder of your wonderful, precious grace towards us. Now, Lord, may your work of Christ-likeness continue to be formed in our hearts this week. Lord, speak to our hearts. Let us know what is it that you are requiring of us. And, Lord, give us the grace that we would be obedient to what you are requiring. For we ask these things in the precious name of Christ.